question? So thank you for being here this morning. I'm Judy Ann Files. If you haven't looked at my outfit. <laughs> I have about six years of being a volunteer out at Montrose Public Lands Visitor Center. Then I had to stop because I did something silly like run for city council and got elected. So eight years now on city council and while I was gone, they kind of changed the name. So if you go out there, you see the name is Montrose Public Lands Information Center. But it's the same place, okay? Mm -hmm. So this morning, Mike is all by himself. This is Mike Barikovich. He's I'm going to pull out the card because you have this amazing title. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> we have a little decent sitting that you can't ever remember. He's the volunteer coordinator and the visitor information specialist. So if you want to be a visitor, he knows it all, right? <coughs> and I told you in the email that uh, Julie Leonard was also coming, but I think you're all aware that there's a pretty big fire going. Yeah. And since she's with Forest Service, she's called out because of the fire. So please welcome Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out today and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, we do live in a very special area and uh, I'm just going to go over some of the highlights of the, from the public lands perspective. Just a little background on me, I'm uh, originally from Western Pennsylvania. I moved out here about five years ago. I uh, started working with the Black Canyon of the Gunnison as an interp ranger. And then about a year ago, I switched over to BLM, which is still under the Department of Interior, and I do volunteer coordination. And then I answer questions down at the uh, front desk there. So I'll go through the PowerPoint a little bit. I won't, you know, death by PowerPoint you, but it'll be kind of short and sweet. And then afterward, we can uh, have some questions and answers. And it's always amazing, even when I go into the kindergarten classes, Nobody fills in from the front to the back. <laughs> and here we are, not filling in from the front to the back. Just curious, you know, why that always happens. But, uh, so thank you though for coming out. This is uh, an amazing opportunity. Uh, has anybody been to the Montrose Public Land Center at all? Okay. So some of us have worked there, most of us have been there. Does anybody not know where the building is? Everybody knows where the building is? Wow. All right, that's good. Well, we, we're down at 2505 South Townsend, um, and it's right off the main road, or the main road of Townsend there, uh, in the brown buildings. And uniquely enough, we actually have three operations going on there. We have the Southwest District Bureau of Land Management Office there, as well as the Young Poverty Field Office for the Bureau of Land Management, and then we have the Ray Ranger District for the Forest Service. So it's kind of nice. The government's trying to to squeeze everybody into one building, put them under one umbrella, it makes sense because it cuts down on tax dollars and uh, we can, well, the idea I think is hopefully to communicate better. Um, that doesn't always happen, but uh, we're trying. So just real quick, this is a picture of the majority of the state of Colorado, basically from Denver over. You can see everything that's in color is all public lands. That's pretty impressive. Is everybody from Colorado? No? Where is it some states people are from? Florida. Florida? Florida. Where are you at? New York? All right, remember back to those home states. Does, do those home states have this many acres of public lands? No? Some of that's because it goes back to the days of the uh, colonies. Um, but we're very fortunate out west uh, to have so much public lands. The green is going to be National Forest, the yellow is going to be uh, Bureau of Land Management, and then the light brown ones are the actual like uh, National Monuments, and then the darker green is the National Parks. This red just kind of highlights the Uncle Paul Gray uh, Field Office area, and then this is uh, a reservation. So you can see there's a lot of property that's public land, and one of the goals of the or one of the missions of the BLM is to use that land for multi-use. So that's putting everybody at the table. So just imagine if I want, if we all wanted to watch TV right now, do you think we'd all agree on what to watch? <laughs> Probably not, right? So it's a very 
big mission we have. Um, but we're very fortunate to have very, very passionate people to, uh, to want to work for the public lands. Here's another map just highlighting the national forest. Uh, these are a few of the, I'm gonna break it down to national forest and BLM, and then I'll, I'll slightly talk about the national park as well. Um, but this is our direct, in our direct area, which we got about 60 to 70% of our area around us, our direct area is public lands. That's amazing, it really is. Uh, one of the main reasons people are moving into this area as vastly as they are is because the access to public lands and the open spaces. Um, the Uray Ranger District is this yellow right here. Uh, this is up near the on, on Pottery Plateau. And you have the Norwood District, uh, the Gunnison District, Hangomi District, and then the Grand Valley District. Has anybody visited these other forests? Gunnison, Crested Butte, things like that? Yeah. So basically, it's our background. It's, it's our backyard playground, right? Uh, this is just a map of the BLM, kind of giving you an, um, an overview. There's three districts that govern the BLM, one's Rocky Mountain, the Northwest, and the Southwest. The district I work for is the Unpopulary Field Office, which is basically right here. Um, as you can see, the BLM stretches in all these different corners of the earth, it seems like, and there are a little bit of everywhere when you consider the out west, the western states. Um, but I think a lot of us don't understand how much property the BLM has. Has anybody visited the Kings of the Ancients at all? Yeah? No? <coughs> this, is, this is just a personal kind of bias, but as we get more populated here, we're going to have to find those other areas out that aren't as populated and they're still as magical, that's one area. So if you're thinking of like, oh, where should I go for a week or where can I go for a long weekend, that would be a great place. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful sites down there. All right, this is gonna highlight um, some, of the, some of the areas in the Uncompahgre Field Office and how many acres we have. We have about 900,000 acres. Like just saying that number out loud is impressive to me. <laughs> I'm like, wow, really? Like, where is that? That's forever, you know? Um, the topography ranges greatly from lowland riparian along the Dolores River uh, to the Red Rock Desert, from the moonscape of highly erodible make, make a shell, the Badlands, and Pinion Juniper Woodlands of the Park Plateau. So basically, we go up from like the Black Canyon of the Gunnison to the Alpine Loop, all the way out towards Utah and Gateway and places like that. So we stretch from desert to mountains. We, have, you know, we really have a unique ecosystem uh, amongst our whole area. And like I said, you know, the 900,000 acres, that's just the BLM. That's just, you know, I own maybe a point two acre in my house. <laughs> maybe. Uh, facts about your local public lands managed by the BLM. Uh, the unique thing I didn't know before I started working for the BLM is that we're in charge of a lot of mineral rights as well. So we have 2.3 million surface areas. You know, that's pretty impressive. But we even have larger amounts of mineral rights. And that goes underneath the forest, um, in some public lands, and, or some private lands, things like that. But you can see some of the unique things that we're in charge of. Let me just find one. Let me, uh, so the perennial streams and rivers. Has anybody been down to the San Miguel at all? That's part of the BLM, and then it goes into the San Juan National Forest, but that's a great place to go. Uh, we have recreation sites, and a lot of the recreation sites aren't as well known or as well used, but we're very fortunate that people like yourselves are getting more involved with the BLM. Um, McKinnis Canyon, National uh, Conservation Area, the Gunnison Gorge National Conservation Area, Dominguez Escalante National Conservation Area. These are extremely powerful places um, when you have the opportunity to go there and visit. Has anyone been to any of the National Conservation Areas in the local area? Who's not been to the NCAs? Oh, it may be brave, see? Brave person raising your hand there. That's good. Well, now you'll have the opportunity because I brought it up. What was that guy talking about? I might as well go see this. 
That way, if anybody ever asks me if I've been doing NCA, I can say yes. Uh, so this kind of just highlights different things that the BLM is in charge of in our local areas. A lot of the streams, mountains, and we have different sorts of managing um, techniques. You know, we have actual wilderness, which was inducted in 1964 by the Wilderness Act. That's in the Gunnison Gorge and Kinnis Canyon and Bingus Escalante. That's some of the most protected property in the world by law, by Congress. And then we have also uh, the opportunity to drill for oil and gas. You know, so the BLM has a very wide spectrum of what they're trying to manage. And they're trying to manage it with, you know, roughly 320 million Americans with everybody having a voice. So it's, it's interesting, let me tell you. <laughs> <coughs> this is in fact just about uh, the National Forest. Uh, like I said or mentioned earlier, we kind of stretch from the Grand Valley all the way down, which is the, the Mesa, Grand Mesa. There's a lot of people who say Grand Mesa, but it stretches basically from Grand Mesa all the way down to Norwood and Uray. Um, they call it, has anybody heard of the term GMUG? So we're all familiar. I mean, we had the GMUG. It's like, what are you doing this weekend? I'm going to the GMUG. You know what I mean? Like, that's pretty awesome. The GMUG gives us all types of different things to do from catching fish in the summer up on Grand Mesa to skiing at Grand Mesa to going down to Ironton and Uray and cross country skiing to hunting up on the Uncle Paul Plateau to mountain biking and using motorized vehicles, i.e., uh, motocross bikes, Jeeps, four wheelers all across, basically from the Grand Valley down through Norwood. That's pretty impressive. Uh, we kind of have something for everybody. You know, not everyone can say that. If anybody wants me to go back and put the slides, I will. All right, this is, this is my little baby right here. This is why I love this map. This, who, who loves maps? Right? Yeah, everybody likes the map. I like a good map, too. An accurate map is the best type of map, you know? The Army used to give me maps years ago, and I used to wander around in the woods thinking, what did I get myself into? But, uh, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, this is the map that you'll see. It's kind of like our flagship map at the visitor center. Um, hopefully, at one point in time, I'll be able to get a relief map, like a 3D. How cool would that be? You know with Black Canyon, they had that big relief map? Wouldn't it be cool if I got this? So when you see people like uh, some of the district rangers, like Dana and the field uh, manager, Greg, mm -hmm. say, hey, what's up with that map, you know? <laughs> uh, don't tell them I said it. <clears throat> this kind of highlights our local area. Has anybody been familiar with this map before? You know? All right, for $25, you can buy right here, right now. No. <laughs> but seriously, you can't. 25 bucks at the visitor center. And what I actually liked about it is that it shows our, it highlights our direct area. Uh, you can see here is the town of Montrose. Here's Ridgeway. We have the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. The Gunnison Gorge National Conservation Area. All the way over to the Dominguez, Escalante the plateau, and then it heads out towards Gateway, Norwood, and Natarita, and those places. And it swings back down <clears throat> towards the San Miguel, Lizard Head Pass, Telluride, all the way over towards the Alpine Loop, um, Uray, and then back up, heading towards Gunnison with uh, the, uh, what am I thinking? National Recreation Area, Kirikani, and then up towards Crested Butte and So it kind of highlights our, our little playground right here next to us. Um, the yellow is going to, or the lighter color is going to, the, the white's private, the yellow is kind of uh, BLM, and then these light greens is the National Forest, and the dark greens is wilderness. Um, the national parks are highlighted by the purple, but that's, that's pretty impressive, right? Like, who here has people visit them from other states? Yeah, everybody, that's one reason we live here. It's like, hey, you can check out where I live. <laughs> check out where I live. You know? um, this is a great map. I put it on my wall, and I'm just like, check it out. This is where we went on that hike, you know? Um, kind of just a broad overview. But I just wanted you all to have the opportunity, if you don't come down and see it, to kind of, to kind of be able to sit back and look at it and be like, dang, that's, that's pretty impressive, right? Especially when you see there's, in my mind, all the... <coughs> 
departments and agencies should try to be striving to work together to achieve a, a, a good goal. You know, sometimes just the top people have different goals, so they don't really stray. Sometimes we have similar goals, um, conservation, preservation, things of that nature. And this is a great example of um, how all our public land agencies kind of coexist and try to work together to provide for the American people, and not even just the people, but um, for the animals and for the trees and stuff. Uh, a wise man, much wiser than me, once said that, uh, but this is when I work for the Park Service, and they're more of a preservation type of flag. It is said that we have to exist to give the animals and the trees a voice, right? Who here has ever put their own will in front of the group or somebody else? <coughs> Nobody? Everybody's always like, you guys go first. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, believe me or not, like at times, I'm a little selfish, and I put myself first. I'm not saying that's a good thing. But I'm saying I'm human, and I make mistakes, and I've done that. And I think sometimes we even do that with our natural resources, i.e. the trees, the public lands, the open spaces. So the public lands, we have an opportunity to give the voiceless a voice, right? That's, that's pretty powerful. Because you really can't hear what a deer is going to hear a deer. They can't understand it. <laughs> uh, maybe can you? I don't know. Uh, in this... So we're going to get out of the local area and we're going to get away from what exists right around our local area, i.e. the national parks, the, the Forest Service, and the BLM. We're going to get into like what can you do at the building, at the Montrose Public Lands Information Center. What can you do there? Well, you come down and just say hi to me, and I'll welcome you with a big hug. So, don't get awkward when you come in there and I hug you, okay? <laughs> I said it's okay right here, right now, so that gives me all the authority to hug it out. Um, that'll happen, and then you can come in and get a bunch of different type of brochures that will basically describe in detail the local area, what you can do there, hiking, biking, hunting, rafting, things of that nature. Um, as well as the forests, they're what we call a working forest. They're, they're, we're doing things on there for a purpose, and we are sometimes taking their resources to feed our needs and wants. Does anybody uh, heat their house with firewood? Well, we got one in the right corner there, sir. All right, oh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, well, believe it or not, we actually, there's a lot of people in the Montrose County that heat their house with firewood. So you can buy a wood permit to go up on the plateau or down near Silver Jack and harvest uh, four cords of wood for roughly 20 bucks. That's a pretty good deal. Uh, most people would burn through either one cord or two cords in a winter. A winter like last year, maybe two or three, right? Um, but that's unique. Like, you know, some places, like in cities, people don't know about cutting wood. Like, how are you going to heat your house with, with a tree? You know? Uh, so that's one thing you're able to do. So that's all dead wood, right? Dead wood and down wood, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, you can cut some live trees, actually. Um, and there's different signs on the managerial reasons why the forest supervisor would, would allow that. Uh, but here's the typical, it's a little blurry, but a wood permit. You come down and uh, we issue it to you right there on the spot. It's about 20 bucks for four cords, that's the minimum. Um, and you get 10 cords per household. And this is a vegetative material, um, little worksheet. This is the BLM side, they also sell wood. Same deal, 20 bucks for four cords. Ideally, a lot of people go up to the forest because they have the bigger trees and they have more selection. On the BLM land, we have more lower elevations, so we have more pinions and um, gamble oaks. So not everybody always wants to burn that. So mainly, we, we sell a lot more uh, forest service than we do BLM. Here's the different tags. The top one in the yellow, that's a forest service wood tag. All you would do is, um, the day you went out to harvest the wood, is punch a hole through the day and a month. And the same thing with the BLM. And then you'd actually attach that to the, the load as you're transporting it from the woods to your house. And you can be stopped by a BLM or a Forest Service person and say, hey, you got a permit for that? 
everybody's pretty lax around here, but believe it or not, some people will go up and try to just take the wood without paying their dues. We all know Uncle Sam wants his cash, so. I recommend getting wood permits if you want to harvest wood. This is a rock permit. Has anybody went down and bought a rock permit before? Yeah, for, it's actually a pretty unique thing. Not every office uh, manages that style, but this one does. So if you uh, have any young nephews or grandchildren or friends that want to have, carry heavy rock and <laughs> mix up some landscaping for yourselves, this is the way it's done. You can come down and see us, and for $13, I'll let you pick up one ton of rocks. Yeah. A CrossFit at GoGo can cost about 100 bucks a month, and some of the other gym memberships can be expensive too. 13 bucks, and you can pick up rocks all day long. You know? So uh, that's something unique. You know, not everybody does that. Um, there's different principles on if it's right or wrong, but at the end of the day, whoever's in charge is allowed to make those decisions, and kind of need to be able to say, hey, I got that from this area, and it's you know now I was be able to have the opportunity to create this beautiful you know, pond with the fish in it in my backyard. So, um, just something to be aware of, you know. But remember, don't bite off more than you can chew. Mm -hmm. It might think romantic in your head, oh, we're gonna redo the backyard, honey. And then, <laughs> then one time later, you're like, why did we do this? <laughs> you would pay me 13 bucks not to let you do it. <laughs> but that's something that's uh, unique right into our office. So if you wanna do some landscaping and pick up some rocks, the Forest Service, uh, the Uray Ranger District, uh, you're not allowed to pick up rocks off the forest. I think up the Grand Valley you are. There's different reasons for that. One of the reasons is that at one point in time eventually we'll take too many rocks and then we'll have to back off, right? Um, the specialists in the office do some pretty calculated math problems and come up with what's appropriate and what's not. Um, and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because I don't know it too well. But there's always what I have seen within the BLM and the Forest Service. Everything we do, we have strong intent, and we uh, do everything very vigilantly um, to assure everyone that the process has been thorough. So uh, that's a good thing. And the government loves its numbers. I don't know why it loves numbers and paperwork, but so we kind of account for all those, uh, all the fuel wood that's harvested. We account for than all the rock permits we account for, too. That's kind of a down and dirty uh, little spiel about the Montrose Public Lands Information Center. Um, now we'll just go right into the questions and the answers, if that's cool. Mike, talk to us about the other things that the Visitor Center has for sale. Oh, yeah, good thing. Ah, there we go. <laughs> There's, yeah. Thank you. I got so nervous that my mind went blank and I forgot about that stuff. <laughs> I, a, I don't like selling stuff to people. If you guys want to buy something, you know where to come find it, right? But let me help you find that area by saying that we do have a lot of unique, uh, what I would call knickknacks and maps and just some cool things that you might want around the house. You know, for Christmas time, you have the opportunity to come down and buy different stuffed animals. <coughs> we have a lot of really good children's books about outdoor education and things like that. And that's something I think that we need to get better at kind of addressing with our youth, right? Because so many people today don't really understand about the public lands. We do because we were fortunate enough to come move out this way and kind of get involved. If you're here right now in these seats in this room, you want to be involved, and that's great. But not everybody wants to. So one way we can do that is uh, through education. You know, so you buy, some, buy somebody in your family a book about um, why water conservation is important and things of that nature, right? Because these are going to be big decisions down the road. In like 40 years, I don't want to be the person in charge of how much water should we give California? Nobody does, right? It's a very, ooh, do you feel how tense it goes? It's a weird subject. But we have to be, we have to be proactive, right? And one way you do that is you start engaging the youth about education and different principles and things like that. So you can buy different books, you can buy teddy bears, you can buy, if you guys wanna come down and hunt in the local area, maps, we got maps out our ears. Um, and then one unique thing that we allow in our forest, uh, with the National Forest and the BLM, is Christmas tree cutting. Who has a fake tree in their house for Christmas time? Shame on you. They told me not to say that, but I just couldn't help it. No, that's not for me to judge on. I'm just going to let you know what you are able to do, and you can 
buy, I think it's usually like eight bucks, you can buy a Christmas tree permit and you go up on the plateau or around the plateau on BLM or National Forest, you cut down your own tree, you drag it back to the car and you can decorate it in your house. That's a unique opportunity. You know, I'm originally from PA and uh, you know, we don't have that chance to go out with the family and cut down the tree. Um, it's like National Lampoon's Vacation. Have you all seen that before, right? <laughs> so don't you kind of want that moment, you know? <laughs> now the government's allowing you to have it, right? So that's one thing we're able to do. Um, I think Christmas tree permits usually traditionally come on sale around Thanksgiving. This year, um, it'll probably occur the first couple weeks of November, and it goes right up to Christmas Day. Um, we might be closed that Friday between Thanksgiving and the weekend because I'm sometimes a lazy government worker and I went that day. But so um, I'll try to do a really good job of publicizing when that is available. And it is really a unique opportunity. Some families in the area have been doing it for decades. So if you want to start a new tradition, uh, it, it's pretty fun from what I uh, have experienced. And then, hmm. Is there anything else I've missed that you would think? You're, you're, you're doing well. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's switch topics. How about talking about the celebration that's happening right now for the Gunnison Gorge? Oh, yes. Oh, boom, shakalaka, right? The Gunnison <laughs> Gorge, uh, you guys, you said you were there earlier, or you visited it. That's a pretty unique opportunity. You can hunt there, you can fish there. Uh, hike, mountain bike, all these things, and it's kind of a, we're celebrating this right now currently, it's 20th, 20th year anniversary. Uh, so part of that is that we have been putting on different events to kind of highlight the opportunities that the public has at those, uh, at the conservation areas, and mainly the Tennessee <coughs> Gorge, you know. What are some things that you all like to do? That way it gives me good feedback on what I should try to provide for my public. So does anybody mountain bike here? A couple. All right. Does anybody like to fish? Fish. Rafting. Rafting. Um, how about walk? Does anybody have dogs here? Does anybody have a dog? No dog owners? No. Oh. So you, a lot of people like to walk their dogs in the gorge. Um, and over the past few weeks, we, we've just been highlighting that. through. Uh, we have an artist in residence, so we had some opportunities to go down there and actually uh, draw and paint the local landscape. Uh, they had a little celebration the other day with uh, the BLM uh, state director. She came out and we had some locals there, the county commissioners, and Ed Franz, he's the Gunnison Gorge manager, so if you ever have any complaints, please just call, call him up, I'll give you his number. Um, it, it's kind of unique though, uh, just to give you all some feedback on the big picture. Um, is anybody familiar with Mark Warner? Who's familiar with Mark Warner? Okay. Mark Warner was a Presbyterian pastor dating back from like the early 1900s of mantras, right? Uh, he did a lot of cool things. He was a pastor, seemed like he's a very community kind of orientated man, served in World War II, you know, put his time, put a lot of, invested a lot of time into his community. Um, he was actually one of the ones that got the National Park established, or the, at that time the National Monument. Black Canyon National Monument, 1933. Um, and he wrote over a thousand letters to Congress and to the state senators to get that. Who here writes letters? Yeah, a couple of wives like one a year, you know, mom, happy birthday, I love you. No, I do better than that. But anyways, the, uh, it's impressive that he was actually persevered to do that. We're talking over a thousand letters. Not a couple and hey, I have a really good idea. He persisted. And that's what it kind of took to get, you got to think, in 1933 to get Wash Montrose, Colorado, get Washington's attention. Where? Who? Why? What? But he was able to do that through correspondence. Um, that eventually led to the inception of the Black Canyon, the Gunnison National Park, as well as the Gunnison Gorge National Conservation Area in 1999. So that's how that ties in. So he started that march for preservation and conservation, you know, almost 100 years ago. And now today we kind of get to sit back and enjoy uh, his his hard work and all the hard work of the people that have come before him up until now. So it's pretty impressive. Um, so I would you know I, I would challenge you to just go out and and go see the Gunnison Gorge and just kind of remember that 
you have this opportunity that's very unique to America and to this direct community. And there is something there for everybody. I wouldn't say go out there in the middle of July, necessarily, but right now it's a beautiful time to be out there. So uh, go out there and just kind of have a time to reflect or a moment to, to meditate on you know where you're trying to go in life and um, what's important to you and things like that. I find it very relaxing to go out there to those special quiet places and to do that. So. But along with those special quiet places, there are a lot of motorcycles out there and ATVs. So the southern end is a little noisy. If you want that quiet place, you're going to have to right. go a little further. Yeah, yes, sir. There are a couple of comments. Um, I, think, uh, I think the Nordic skiing is just fantastic. Wait a second, Tim. Wait for me. Oh, she's going to bring you a microphone. So I, I think the Nordic skiing is, is really fantastic up there, and I want to, you know, commend the staff up there for, you know, for grooming those trails. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's really great. A uh, complaint I have about, about your office is I go down there and buy those fancy National Geographic maps. Mm -hmm. And when you start following the trails and everything else, the, the trail stops on the map. And it's really difficult to, you know, figure some kind of a, some kind of a loop. So I don't know, if, <laughs> I don't know if you can do anything about that. But um, and the question, one of the questions I have is <clears throat> on law enforcement, and that's, um, uh, you know, the cost of picking up trash and and uh, you know following up on illegal um, campsites and things like that. You know, people go up there and they're homeless or whatever, and they just absolutely ruin the places that I love to go to see. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so <clears throat> there's like <coughs> three parts to that from what I heard. One, good job to Black Canyon and the Gunnison for grooming the trails. Um, another one, the National Geographic maps aren't genuine enough. And the third was uh, how can we start educating the public on not to dump on our public lands and how can we start enforcing those rules that already are uh, active. So the Net Geo thing is if, if you really want, this is the process. If you come in to me and say, you know, just come in and say, hey, Mike, I need to talk to you about this map. Say I walked out here and then it cut off. What I can do is like I'll just reach out to Nat Geo and say, hey, I had a customer come in here and he said or she said that this map went four miles out and then it, it did it actually only went two miles out and then that's the feedback I'll give to them they'll try to uh, annotate it on the next year that's that's that process so it'll, so it'll take a while but they do send out different people throughout the year and say hey are, are, is our maps doing well or are they doing bad and you know with the competition in America for different maps and stuff everybody's trying to be better so that's one way we could try to fix that problem um, to the to the, the dumping issue, it's horrible. People, it is horrible. I have personally helped pick up over 30,000 pounds of trash in this past 365 days. With the help of great partnerships, Thunder Mountain Wheelers, West Corps, um, the city and counties of Montrose and Delta. I mean, it's an issue. It's, it's, a, it, it's so deep, it's, it's, it goes to humanity. Like, every adult knows not to go up there and do drugs. Every adult knows not to go up there and throw their couch. It's the imperfections of mankind. And so how do you fix that? It's one of the hardest questions ever asked. How I want to try to battle it in this local area is that A, we get into the schools, start educating the youth about this is not the way. You know, for a long time in America, the way was take it out to the back 40 and get rid of it. You know, only recreation has come up to the forefront in the past 20 years. So how we can do it here is A, work with the BLM and the Forest Service on picking up what actually exists out there and then putting signs in the ground saying, hey, West Corps clean this up. Because if I go out there and put a sign saying BLM did, some people hate the government for a thousand different reasons, right? And so they're just gonna say, good for them, they deserve that, you know? I personally cleaned out probably, I don't know, 30 pounds of old elk meat out of a freezer that was stuck up in the North Delta Adobe Battalions in the middle of summer. You know, it's a hot topic for me. I think it's very personal. Um, cigarette butts, one of my personal pet peeves. Yeah, I'm coming over to say something. Um, I probably shouldn't say this, but this is the truth. 
We need to be better with law enforcement. There's, there's, we need to have more law enforcement or more people with the authority to give tickets to have eyes on those. The only way that's going to occur is if the public puts pressure on the agencies. Because we have roughly about 800,000 acres. You know, we can't have eyes anywhere. Um, and I know this is probably a lot of the stuff that you've heard before, but it, it is near and dear to my heart, and I, I do want to answer it truthfully and honestly. We need to just be better. We need more money to have more jobs, to have more eyes on the ground. And we have to kind of have a rallying of the community and the agencies to say, hey, we want this to stop and let it be known. Now, the way we can do that is we can uh, go with education, get them in the schools, do like a leave no trace, and we do do that. You know, we, we do, but maybe we need to do it more. Um, another way we could do it is, um, you know, what is the process if you find a receipt that Jerry left in the pile of trash with all his garbage, and you notice that's all his mail, what do you do? Do you collect that and take it back to the BLM and say, hey, can you start an investigation? Like, what is that process? I don't personally know because I'm not in law enforcement, um, but as you do, I'm very curious. Like, you know, can, can that lead to an arrest? Um, and then it seems like we have to be better at kind of publicizing our wins. Um, and I think we will do better because now we have, the, we had two PIO positions that weren't filled in the BLM for like last year in the local area. <coughs> now those are both filled. What that allows us to do is publicize like what good things we're doing. Did anybody know like two weeks ago that West Quarter and the BLM went up and cleaned up I don't know, 10,000 pounds of trash? No, but it, um, so we did for National Public Lands Day. You know, bless their heart. Uh, there was an old trailer up there that they were most likely people were selling drugs out of and those people went away and um, we were able to go in there and clean it up. But it's, it's disgusting and it's hurtful when you go out there. I know what you're feeling like you go to those nice places and you're like, this is happening? Uh, so <clears throat> I think with the PIOs, we're gonna try to start a campaign. I mean, you have to understand, I'm not, I'm very low on total pool, but this is what I need to hear. I need to hear your voices so that I can go up to them and you know, gripes go up, gripes don't go down. So maybe that's my key in this. I have to gripe in a tactical manner to get the point across and what the public is conveying. And I think that'll happen. Um, and it is starting to turn for the better. You know, traditionally, the BLM was known as just, um, yeah, just take it out there. You don't have to pay the landfill. Just take it out to that other spot. We just need to be better each other, you know, all of us. Um, and then stress those, stress to the people that, that public lands isn't for that anymore. Right? It's, that's not the proper way. The proper way is to take it to the landfill. Another way is that you work with your partnerships with the city and the counties and you say, hey, can we have more free uh, dump days? You know what I mean? Because that's one of the issues. And then you educate. Most people, most trash I pick up outside, you can take it down to regular metals and get money for it. People just don't know that. They just think, I want this out of my life, and they toss it. Well, that's 20 bucks. And so it's completely asinine, because you're, you could be getting paid for that trash, right? So anyways. All right. Am I okay. I have I have two questions. Yes. And I have the mic. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> That's right. Um, the first one on one of your slides it showed grazing, and we know from watching the sheep in the valley, sheep and cattle in the valley, and then they go to the high country. How does that all work? Is it expensive for the ranchers to be on your land? Um, how much are the grazing fees? So that whole process. And the second question is totally different. There's been a lot of hoopla about the BLM moving to Grand Junction. And I've heard that's a good thing, and I've heard that's a bad thing because you're losing your representation in, or some of it, in D.C. Um, what's your opinion on that? So, ooh, two. Ooh, a slippery slope on that part, too. 
if I can make part one last the next 20 minutes, I might not be able to get to that part soon. Um, so it all started in a small town just west of Pittsburgh. Um, the grazing, the grazing is a very unique thing. Um, it's one of the older uh, industries of America, agriculture and grazing. Kind of like the first two things that was occurring in this local area for sure, and definitely as uh, America was being formed. Uh, so grazing goes back a long, long time. Most of the grazing in these uh, bigger areas up on the plateau and stuff, some of them have been around since the conception of mantras, you know. Uh, it seems that as we move forward, we have noticed that there has been a lot of overgrazing in certain areas. But the process of addressing that is very uh, involved it takes a long time. The, the price of the permits, I don't know. You could come down and I could set you up with the specialist. That's the way to do it. If you come down and say, hey, I would like to talk to the grazing range specialist, then you could have a sit down with them. That's the way it's done. I don't know, I'm not the specialist. Um, but as a topic. Dollar uh, 35 a month for a challenge. Okay, dollar 35. I've been for 30 years, I work there. Perfect. So, dollar thirty-five for cow and calf. Ideally, what I look at, it's pretty affordable, from what I understand. What I think your real question maybe was, or what everybody's thinking, maybe this is just my, my how what I think you are thinking is, uh, is the cost worth the benefit to the person that owns those cows? Yes. To uh, the greater good of the public, that's an interpretation. So there's a lot of different lawsuits and discussions that are uh, a fluid situation that are occurring right now. But grazing has been one of the leading industries in this local area since and before the time Montrose became a town in 1882. How do you decide who gets what? Like if the Etchards want it and the Leonards want it, who gets it? Whoever I'd like better. <laughs> no. um, again, I, I, I'm not trying to like pass the buck. I just don't know, ma'am. I'm not the special. I'm not the grazing specialist, so I don't want to talk to that because I don't know it well enough. Is that, is that fair? All right. What was the second one? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, people. This is what's happening. Okay. Now you heard it here first. You take this to the bank. Mike Marinkovich said. No. Um, you hit those two ideals right on the nail. Now, some of us feel that Grand Junction coming out to the west will be good because that puts the troops in the trenches, right? And the best way to see what's going on in the battlefield is from the trench, not three miles behind watching the artillery rain down, right? Now, the only problem with that is in this country, most of our decisions are made in Washington. And if you're in Washington and you're constantly nagging on the people that are there, they're going to pay attention to you. If you're far, far away and you're just saying, hey, hey, and that other person's there, me, 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 you're most likely going to pay attention to the me. In today's technology, people can fly from point A to point B, I think probably within five, five and a half hours. So if a decision needs to be made and you need somebody there in person, you have five and a half hours to get there. And the, uh, the people at those the people in that in that high up position, they have that ability to get from point A to point B within that time frame. Uh, so it's it's an unknown, it's an unknowable answer because it's not been done before. Uh, so if you would look at the schools of thought, it's always been good to be in DC because that's where they're made. But now we have teleconference. You know, we give other people the authority to write our signatures and stuff like that. So um, unfortunately, we're just going to have to. It's one of those things we're going to have to move through it and experience it and then kind of know if it was the right thing or the wrong yeah. thing. Um, I think it's worth trying. I mean, that's a personal thing. That's not to be on. That's just me. I need my fresh house Sorry. Two quick ones, I hope. Uh, yeah. One, I hear that there's a hot shop facility being constructed in your backyard. True. Like my personal backyard on Bristol Street, no, you know. Just, yeah. <laughs> I call myself a hot shot from time to time. <laughs> um, yeah, there is. A, I don't know if would you consider it a hot shot. What's what's happening at the public lands 
building area is that they're building a new fire station. So what the BLM does is we're governed by Congress to, we can't make any larger buildings. Our old fire building is dilapidated and asbestos and stuff like that. And it's um, unfit to, uh, from American standards. So they have to build a new facility to, to ensure the safety and the you know, well-being of the, of the uh, firefighters. Um, so that building is going on. So what will happen is they'll eventually, they're transitioning. I think Stryker won the bid and they're putting up a new fire facility. It might house hot shots or probably house uh, at least the different engines that exist now currently on the premises and then maybe a hot shot crew, but I do know that it can't be any more, it can't be any bigger than the existing building. I didn't realize it was replacing an old structure. Yeah, that's it. We can't, I think right now we're not allowed to build new buildings. So you have to have, you know, you have to um, have a reason why this one's dilapidated so they're building new ones. The second question yep. has to do with uh, informal camping. Yeah. When we drive up in to your areas, we see people <laughs> and campers just sort of look like they just pull off the road. Is that legal, marginal, or what? What's what is? Yeah. So it's, all rules on that. Um, it's a good question. I think we're talking about dispersed camping. Um, ideally, and as long as you're not in the campground or an area that's already being used for special use, that would be addressed there like at a boat launch or something of that nature, um, or possibly a wilderness area that, uh, you can disperse camp on the national public lands for two weeks. Um, on the Forest Service, you can camp for two weeks, and then you have to go uh, to a different forest, i.e. you go to Ray, your Ray Ranger District for two weeks, and then you go to Norwood Ranger District. Um, and you can't exceed 60 days or 30 days in one month, you know, um, and then the BLM, you can, disperse camp for two weeks in a lot of the different areas, and then you have to move at least five miles as a crow flies. Um, so uh, the Forest Service, you actually on this forest, the way it's managed is you have 300 feet from the roadway that you're allowed to uh, drive off of, as long as you don't uh, hurt or damage the resource. Um, and then, yeah, so you basically have two weeks you can pull right off the side of the road. The BLM, technically, you have to, if you have a vehicle, you have to pull right adjacent or parallel with the, with the roadway. If you're uh, walking or horsing in, you can just go as far as you want. So two weeks. Yes, sir. I just wanted to add a little bit to that question about the move from, for, from Washington to Grand Junction. Um, having worked for the BLM for 31 years, the Washington office primary mission is to deal with policy and budgetary stuff with Congress and that sort of thing. What they're proposing is to move 27 of 300 to Grand Junction and disperse the other 260 or 70 in state offices throughout the BLM. I don't see how that's going to help communication even with today's technology. I, they use the the rationale that's going to, that they need to be closer to the ground, but Right now, 97% of BLM is on the ground, like our office here. Their mission back there is not to be on the ground, it's to be dealing with policy and budgetary matters. So I just wanted to throw that out there to further that a little bit, give you some food for thought. What is your volunteer need at the information center and what is the commitment? I know oh, with the yeah. park service, it's like Eight hours a day, five days a week. <laughs> Evil like, Park Service. What? <laughs> no, that's a great question. Thanks for bringing it up. That reminds me. Yeah, one of my titles. Titles. It's like as bad as nicknames. I have about volunteer those. coordinator. Yeah, volunteer coordinator. So basically, um, what we kind of need is volunteers for the front desk is very helpful because that kind of frees us up to do some paperwork and then to go out into the field as well. So that kind of looks like usually uh, once a week for four hours a day. Um, just for about three or four months out of the year, basically from Memorial Day through Labor Day. So if anybody's interested in that, it's pretty chill. You just sit behind the desk and you know, help answer the phones, and we'll tell you how to run the sales. Uh, Sam One Mountain Association is our nonprofit that we work with, um, and that's who actually sells all the goods, except for the fuel, wood, and raw permits. Um, but it's, for the front desk volunteers, you have four hours a, a week, and 
if you could, you know, try to come from Memorial Day to Labor Day around that time frame. But we're flexible. We can talk. I mean, <laughs> what's it going to take? Um, for the other programs, what I would like to do is, what I'm trying to do is build yearly events, i.e., um, we have a loft and scatter up on the north rim, what I would call the north rim, it's kind of off between Crawford. We have thousands of acres that we're trying to save for sage grouse. So every day or every year around um, August, I'm going to set in place like, a, like the third Wednesday of the month in August, we're going to go out and loft and scatter 100 acres. Um, right now we kind of do it right around uh, National Public Lands Day, and I want to try to build that as a routine if I can. Um, and what I can do now that we have PIOs, people that actually talk to the public about the information that's going on between the agency and the community, I can help, I can say, hey, you need to publicize my event. Put it in the newspaper, talk to the forum, you know, put it on the radio, get down there with KBNF. You just need to be better communicators. Um, but I'm going to start being more of a thorn in the side, so that should start addressing that issue from my perspective. So, but thanks. Yeah, if you guys want to sign up as a volunteer, please come down and visit us at the Public Lands Building, and um, we'll go over some forums and some ideas. And you know, there's all time, there's all kinds of different ways to volunteer. And ideally, with BLM, we're so nitty gritty. Like that's how we get a lot of things done. So to be honest, we don't have the manpower and the budget. We we don't get the budget we want or need. So volunteers really do a lot of the uh, the hard work of the BLM, and especially locally, like. Like I said, like West Corps, they, they cleaned up 10,000 pounds of trash. I mean, I was out there picking stuff up, but I didn't get that. Their front loader and, you know, the eight people they brought, they got that. I just facilitated the meeting place and point A to point B. Uh, anyways, yeah, anything else? What so I'm assuming this time of year, from back from, from my time, uh, this time of year it's hunters coming in that want to know where to go, okay, but also, then where to go in town? Where can we go to do our laundry? Where can we go for dinner? So it's just general information, but sometimes you have to change your hats pretty often because then the next person in might want to know about a grazing permit, <laughs> okay? So it's just, it's just fun. I, I think it's cool. You, well, I guess one of my favorite things to do is to tell people where to go. <laughs> and we've been working on that with her. She's gotten a lot better. <laughs> it's taken eight years on council. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> some of the campgrounds, the National Forest Campgrounds, uh, camping fee tripled this year, even for seniors. So as we see those prices go up, we'll see more dispersed camping, I presume, and we'll see more people trashing the BLM, BLM lands at the same time. Like that's kind of a cut your nose off, spite your face deal, because those prices did triple this year in some of the campgrounds, mm. even for seniors. Um, yep, that's a bit, it's on our radar, and thanks for bringing it up. The, the, the suggestion I would make is to contact the local district ranger and talk with the recreation department um, yeah, the prices went up. There's nothing to do about that. Well, maybe it's the concert, uh, concessions. Maybe they have a talk with that concession that runs the campground and say, hey, can you back off your prices a little bit? Or what amenities are you bringing in? Or did you just hike them up so that your CEO gets more money? Mm -hmm. You can inquire about why there was a hike up in prices on your public lands in your local area. Mm -hmm. But maybe that takes you writing a letter or coming down in person. But you're going to have to be patient, you know. Um, there is a lot of moving parts to the Forest Service and the BLM, uh, and that's one issue that we, we are well aware of. Um, I don't want to pay to camp. I'm actually not going to pay at a campground. I'm going to go to dispersed camps. Um, unfortunately, that what's happening is there's so many people, right? It, it always goes back to that. There's so many of us wanting to use the same resource. How do you manage that? That's yeah, so you want the government to figure it out, right? Um, well, you tell people to do the right thing, and when they don't, you enforce them to. Uh, it's an ongoing issue, and I think maybe that we just have to be better at educating, you know, about how do you treat the land. Uh, here's a for instance, and sorry to beat this, but um, 
it seems to be all about communicating and getting the right message across. Uh, we pulled out 18 toilets from Box Canyon area. Is anybody familiar with Box Canyon? Okay, beautiful, beautiful area, right? We carried out 18 little toilets. Now, who do you think put those toilets there? And do you think those people knew that that was the right decision? Hey, who here thinks the right decision was to leave that toilet in the woods? <laughs> who here thinks the person that did it knew better, but for some reason was human and just eh, right? So how do you correct that behavior? Those are big questions. And I'm trying to work at it. Me, personally, I want to go out there and put a boot in the butt. Say, hey, clean up the crap. But uh, I have to have more tact than that. So how do I do that? <clears throat> you educate and you get more people on the ground. Boots on the ground. What this is always going to come back to is money. Here's, all right, here's, here's one thing. This is kind of biased. Thanks for tape recording this. Appreciate it. <laughs> hey, one last question. Oh. Yes, uh, how do you interface with the parks and wildlife of the state and also our Montrose County Sheriff's Office? Uh, it's a good question. Um, the first one is we... Any, uh, here's an example. Say if we want to build a trail, say the public, like Comp Mova, it's a partnership uh, of mountain bikers in the local area. If they suggest we build a trail, we have to go look at that trail, see if it would be a good idea, erosion, soil types, things like that. And then we have to ask, how would that affect the wildlife? So then we go over to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife and we say, hey, how, if we would build a trail on our property here, is this going to interface or inter you know is this going to have an exchange with your wildlife the corridors of migration and things like that so we go to their wildlife specialist and say hey can you give us some feedback on this so they have a say at the table too um if colorado parks and wildlife say hey that's going to really hurt our real here uh they can have the authority to kind of sway our decisions so that's how we work with them um, we also do a lot of uh fish biology in our local rivers and streams uh, directly with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, getting on the, their boats and counting, help counting fish and seeing the health of those fish and things like that. So we kind of go right to them and ask them if this is okay. Um, this is how I've seen it done. And then what was the second part? What was Sheriff's Office. Sheriff's Office. Okay, ideally in the perfect world, um, if the, the, he, within America you have, different, you have different agencies, we're all aware of that, state troopers, National Park Service Rangers, BLM Rangers, Forest Service Rangers, Sheriff, Posse, Municipalities of Montrose, right? So ideally they would build a relationship saying, hey, if I see an emergency going on in your property, do you give me authority? Um, and they have those relationships worked out. They're, they're pre, uh, uh, they already, they pre-exist. Here, I think pretty much, uh, I don't know exactly how it works, but I know that a sheriff can uh, go on to BLM property and make an arrest or intervene if he sees a, a lawless or a, an unlawful act. But that doesn't always exist in every situation, but here locally that does. Uh, but then we get into the idea of, well, if you ask the sheriffs, they're going to say they're undermanned. If you ask the BLM, they're going to say they're undermanned. And everyone's going to say, hey, we need more money, you know. Uh, but that's how that works. They just, uh, you could call the sheriff's office if you see a crime going on, and sometimes they'll dispatch it to us, and we'll dispatch it to them once we clarify where it's at and how the community should react to that threat. This past month, there's been several different celebrations, though, talking about this unique cooperation that we have in our area. We have cooperation between BLM and Forest Service that you don't see other places, National Park Service, also CPW, State Forest. Um, it, it's a, a really unique partnership. The people from the Front Range say they don't have that on the other side. Each agency works independently. And over here we have a really great cooperating, collaborative issue going. Sorry, Ron, we're out of time. Yeah, uh, I'd just like to throw a plug in for the Sheriff's Posse. Yeah. And they provide oh. a remarkable service for those public lands that the people in Washington have absolutely no idea what it's like to have 70% or more of their land uh, in their, their particular county owned by the public. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was very informative, but you have a level of humor that I hadn't expected.